Well, good morning, church. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father in heaven, and our risen Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Man, I was at a uh, gathering of clergy people uh, around 2015, a few years back, and I, and I was with this Episcopal priest, a local priest who was really awesome, great guy who used to write a column in the local newspaper, cool dude, and uh, he was sharing some thoughts uh, about how we as Christians are to live in a world where so many are divided by politics and race and economic status and all the troubles in the world. And as he reflected on the political debates that were happening around that time, he couldn't help but realistic, but be realistic. And he said something that stuck with me. He said, I think we're due for some suffering. Man, yeah, it seemed like a, such a hopeless thing to say at the time. And I, I don't think he was trying to be pessimistic or predicting the future or wishing that on anyone, but just naming what he saw as this declining spirit of unity in the world, in our nation that has become clear to many of us in the last few years. And while this observation has seemed to come to pass in many ways, so many of us continue to serve, to pray, to gather, to build up the body. We show up, right? We show up despite the troubles that we all face every day. But how does that happen? How do we keep moving forward surrounded by suffering and danger? How do we live? I'm gonna give you a minute to talk about that in just a little while, so be warned. But this seems to be the question that Peter is getting at in this third chapter of his letter. Suffering and this early Christian population. Persecution. Well, remember that the communities that received this letter were ones that would have included Jewish and non-Jewish citizens, maybe foreigners, artisans, merchants. Some more privileged than others. Some whose very lives were at risk because of their confessions of faith. Christianity was not the mainstream, and these very first churches were still trying to figure out how to survive how to be the body of Christ in those kind of uh, under difficult conditions, how to interact with the world around them. But this letter gives encouragement, right? We talked about that last week. Also a warning to those who would be tempted to either hide their faith or deny it or lash out at those who would punish them for their beliefs. And maybe, maybe it seems hard for us to relate at times to this kind of suffering, the kind of suffering they would have faced. But it's not hard to imagine what life is like for our neighbors, maybe who come from a different place, who worship in ways different from our own, or who hold contrasting beliefs. Just across the street from this church is another building uh, that has historically been a home to the Baptist church. Some of you know it, some of you know it well. It started long ago as the first Victory Baptist Church in Las Vegas. I think I have that right. About 10 years ago, when I, when I came, it was Pathways Church, and I met the pastor and his wife, and they were actually living in that building and trying to figure out what was going on there. Soon after uh, they moved out, the building was purchased by a large congregation in Summerlin and uh, was relaunched as the Hills downtown. And Pastor Greg was such a great part of this community, and we got to do some things over there together. But that's changed now, too. It closed down in 2020, and now that is a home for a Buddhist community. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And some of you may have noticed they planted a bunch of trees. They fenced off the property to keep it safe. Uh, and it, it may be a little confusing for neighbors, I'm sure, as there are still crosses on the building and all over the, the fences there. Maybe that will change. I don't know. But they dress differently. They might seem like outsiders around here. And to a bar, be a part of a, a faith tradition that is outside the American mainstream can be difficult. And we've heard reports, not here necessarily, but in many places of vandalism or discrimination, even violence against people who practice other faiths, maybe just because someone is from another culture, country, or race. Imagine that kind of difficulty in your faith life. If you had to worry about being a Christian in the world, about what someone would say to you or do to you or think about you, Maybe that's hard to imagine, but think about this question. And now here's your chance to answer. 
When was it difficult for you to be a Christian? What makes it hard for you to follow Jesus? Maybe we don't get that kind of persecution in our daily lives, but we all have those times when maybe it's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to tell somebody you're a Christian. Or maybe it's just hard to follow Jesus some days. So I want you to take a minute, talk to someone next to you. You don't have to answer loud for the group. Talk to somebody nearby, maybe a family member, maybe in the row in front of you. Maybe you haven't met that person, so say hello to them. Find out their names. Make sure they get a name tag before they leave today and answer that question. When was it hard for you to be a Christian? When was it hard to follow Jesus? And if you're watching online, you can type an answer in the comments. We'll give you a minute. What'd you think? What did you hear? Who wants to share? All right, take, take a minute to share. What did you hear someone say? When was it hard to be a Christian or hard to, to follow your faith? Anybody want to be brave? Sarah, no? Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> Go ahead, Helen. Behind the wheel of a car, yeah. Yeah, I knew, I knew Pastor Matt was thinking that one, too. Maxine, what did you say? It was hard for me when uh, my dad passed away. Yeah, hard when your dad passed away, yeah. Tia? When I came out in school. When I came out in school, hard to, hard to do that and be a Christian sometimes, yeah. All right, Sarah's in. When I don't give what I want, when I don't get better. When I don't get better or get what I want, yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing. That, that was awesome. Maybe it, it seems hard to relate to the kind of suffering that, that other people face at times, but, but maybe not. Maybe we do have those moments when it's difficult and we, we face particular hardships and we find that maybe God is not responding to the prayers that we've been praying. Maybe not in the way we would desire. Or when we lose someone we love and find out that life is not fair. I hope nobody promised you life would be fair. Or when terrible things happen in the world and we wonder how God could allow such suffering. Anybody think about that? Yeah. I can't think of a time when people around me really made it difficult or dangerous to share my beliefs in God. But it was rarely the cool thing to do. I thought maybe people would think I was weird if I started all this Jesus talk while we were out playing at a nightclub and with a rock band or something. Maybe I might feel awkward at times to share faith. And I do find it painful that all Christians get grouped in with the ones who hurt others or set a bad example. That sometimes makes it hard to be a Christian. And maybe we don't even like to use that word anymore. I know people who don't like to say Christian. Maybe they say, I follow Jesus. Maybe they say, I follow the word. Maybe they don't say anything. But I've never had to fear for my life because of my faith tradition. But others know this reality far better than I do. So even if we don't know that kind of persecution, we can still be encouraged by this letter and to learn how to live in dangerous times because every time is a dangerous time, I think. We can hear this call not to hide from the world around us, but to give a reason for the hope that is in us. 
to share how it is that we can continue to grow and thrive and believe when the pain of the world reaches our doorstep, to give a defense, a reason, an answer, a why, an answer to the question why we have hope. People want to know, why do you continue to go to church when so many have drifted away? Why do you continue to believe in God when there is so much death and violence in the world? How can you stand to be associated with those people who judge others, who hate their neighbors, who hurt people, and then name themselves as Christians? Maybe these are hard questions to answer. They are worth considering, and we should take the time to get to the heart of what it is we believe and how it forms us for life in the world. And we pray that our lives would show God's goodness. Sometimes they do. Other times, like in traffic, maybe it's more difficult. Where we know God, though, where we see Christ most fully is where God has chosen to be revealed to us. In the cross. In Christ's suffering, we see what it really means to be a follower of this suffering servant. It's here that we learn that despite the pain of this world and the terrible destruction that we cause and that we experience in the creation, and the failures we live with, that we are still loved, transformed, resurrected and recreated with our Lord and Savior who died for us and rose again with new life for all. And our troubles and all our suffering, along with our moments of joy and delight, are a part of this new life that we have been given, gifted with. It's a gift from God. Each moment is a blessing. And even when we cannot see it and we don't have to know all the reasons why everything happens to us or compare our lives to the world around us, we can be blessed to know that we are different. We are given the gift of God's grace, forgiveness, and eternal life in our baptism. And maybe people will think you're weird if you walk around the grocery store telling everybody about your new life in baptism and the eternal gift of God's grace that has been given to you without merit or on account of works. People will that person's a little wacky. But it's so good to say it, to tell someone, to believe it. So Peter reminds the hearers of this story then of Noah and the ark. Oh yeah, remember him? Noah is one called out from his community, mocked, persecuted even for following God's direction in his life when others around him might have thought he was stupid or a loser or a little insane. He trusted God and because of this was saved from the flood along with his family. Peter reminds this early Christian community of this story of God's salvation. And you have already been saved from death and sin and the evil of the world too. We are filled with this promise of new life in Christ as we are ones who have risen up from those same waters of baptism, washed and welcomed, formed and sent, marked with the sign of the cross, that is Christ's suffering, welcomed into the family of the saints of God and sent into the world. William Barclay writes that a saint is someone whose life makes it easier to believe in God. And maybe saints are like the ones we think of, like Mary Magdalene, known as the Apostle to the Apostles, the first to proclaim Christ risen from the dead. We remembered her this week. Or those famous saints from history that you know their names. Maybe you don't know what they did. St. Francis, St. Jude, St. Vincent. But they are also the ones who've given us the reason for the hope that is in them. The ones who demonstrated to us what a life of faith can look like, what it ought to be. They were ones who invited us to Bible study, who sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, to us as children, who welcomed us back after we had been fallen away or gone for a long time. Hi, Pat. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> They were ones who helped us not to lose hope. 
the ones who showed up in our times of need, who sat with us in our grief and loss. And they share their faith with grace, with humility, not to brag or boast, but to share their own story for the sake of building up the body of Christ. This is the encouragement that we need and a path to living in dangerous times, a recipe for sharing the heart of Christ in the heart of the city. We are to call to give a defense, give a reason, give an explanation for the hope that is in us. What is it inside you that keeps you going, that keeps you believing, that keeps you faithful when times are so difficult, when your life gets hard, when times are bleak, even when suffering comes? That others may know they are not alone that they too belong to God even when their suffering comes. One interpreter writes that uh, our faith must be a first-hand discovery rather than a second-hand story. So I've shared in this place all often about my faith and experiences and favorite seminary professors and Sunday school teachers, my grandmother and church members who've been a part of my faith journey, and you have your own stories too. Maybe you've heard though that faith is caught more than it is taught. Caught more than it is taught, right? So it is powerful when we get to invite others into this life of faith. Come, catch that spirit with us. Often by asking them to come to church with us, but also by enticing them to serve with us, to rejoice and celebrate with us. And it's okay if they start by thinking we're a little weird. I hope they see that, because we are. <laughs> and name it. Embrace it. Keep the church weird, people. Enjoy it. Because the promise from Jesus is that all who have suffered in this life, the outsiders, the losers, the, the loners, the humble, the hurting, the powerless, and the peacemakers, all belong in the kingdom of God. And in fact, will be the ones who see the Lord. We have hope to share with the world around us. That's why we keep coming. That's why we keep showing up. And our hope is not in the things that this world cares about. Not in success or power or money or status. But in the one who has already suffered the most. The one who has died for us. And for the God of grace who persists in welcoming us back to the Lord. Back into the fold. Who speaks to us and sends us from here to love and to be of service to our neighbors. No matter what they say or do or think about us, we proclaim Christ crucified and risen, the hope that is in us today and always. Amen.